two men, two mitres, two stories, one cause, one death. Shared glory. Saint Stanislas of Stepanov. Saint Thomas a Becket. During the High Middle Ages, two European bishops who rankled royalty shared a remarkably similar fate. They were both slain in scenes that have become etched in the memories of both countries, Poland and England. 2020 marks 990 years since the death of Saint Stanislaus and 900 since the birth of Thomas a Becket. Despite the gulf of time that separates us, perhaps the lives of these two men can provide us with a message about our own day and age. Today, we can analyse the lives of these two saints with recourse to historical documents, legends, and bearing in mind the traits of human nature. But can we settle the disagreements and disputes that have arisen around them. Both saints made deep marks in European history. They influenced and guided the thinking of constitutionalists, and they brought thousands to the bosom of the Catholic Church. But let's put aside the analysis of historical documents and the study of saints' relics just for a moment. Medieval Renaissance songs were written in honor of the two saints. And over the centuries, artists and sculptors uh, provided many renditions, scenes from their lives. Perhaps these elements can provide a prism through which we can view their lives in a different manner. When we look at the lives of both saints, clear parallels emerge. Their careers had similar beginnings. Both met a dramatic end, and the scale and significance of their cults was much the same. Nevertheless, a century divided both men. AD 1030. According to the Polish chronicler Jan Długosz, Stanislaus was born on the 26th of July in Szczepanów, a small village near Kraków. He was the son of Wielisław and Bogna, and his mother supposedly gave birth to him in a field beneath an oak tree. He was the long-awaited only son of a deeply religious couple who hailed from the petty nobility. The parents saw that he was an inquisitive and intelligent boy, and sent him to the cathedral school in Krakow, and then on to the nearby monastery in Tinyats. He received a broader education in Gniezno, the former Polish capital, and furthered his studies abroad in Paris and Liège. This Belgian city was a cradle of theological learning at that time, as well as an arena for church reform. After seven years of studies, Stanislas returned to Krakow, at the age of 25, he became a canon and was ordained as a priest. This was in 1065. His many talents, self-discipline, wisdom and prudence did not fail to escape the attention of Duke Boleslas, who was resident in Krakow at that time. In 1072, the Duke appointed the 35-year-old Stanislaus as bishop of the city's cathedral on Varvel Hill. The new bishop busied himself with improving the cathedral and spreading the word of God, both in his own diocese and across other Polish lands.
1118. Thomas Beckett was born in Cheapside, London on the 21st of December. That was the feast day of Thomas the Apostle. He was the son of Gilbert and Matilda Beckett. Thomas's parents were of Norman stock. His father was a wealthy merchant and he owned a number of properties in London. At the age of 10, Thomas was sent to be educated at Merton Priory, where he was taught by the Canons Regular. This began in 1130. He moved to Paris for his higher education, and on his return, he gained employment in the house of Theobald of Beck, Archbishop of Canterbury. Theobald duly sent him to study canon law in Bologna and Auxerre, and on Thomas's return, the Archbishop appointed him as Archdeacon of Canterbury Cathedral. This was in 1154. Shortly afterwards, on account of Becket's success, Theobald recommended his protégé to King Henry II after the post of Lord Chancellor became vacant. Thomas took up the position in 1155. AD 1076. Kraków. At first, cooperation between the bishop and Duke Boleslav went very smoothly. Boleslav was crowned King of Poland on Christmas Day, and Stanislas advised Boleslav on state affairs. But the king was absorbed in struggles to regain lands lost by his predecessors. He became conceited about his victories and rarely returned to Kraków. His soldiers often celebrated their victories in a rather crude manner, breaking both laws and moral codes. The bishop tried to admonish the king that his actions were dangerous and bewailed the decadence that had taken root in the land. Stanislas began to openly criticize the ways in which Boleslas conducted his policies and ultimately endeavored to punish him. It's not clear from sources whether he threatened the king with excommunication or whether he actually had him excommunicated. The bishop was accused of treason. 
He was summoned before the royal court, but he did not appear, professing that canon law forbid him to do so. Nevertheless, he was unlawfully sentenced to death by the king. Sixty-two. Canterbury. Following the death of Theobald, Becket was nominated for the post of Archbishop of Canterbury. He resigned from his position as Chancellor and was ordained as a priest. King Henry hoped that Thomas would not check the growing power of the throne in relation to the church, but the new bishop radically changed his whole way of life dedicating himself to asceticism and prayer. His erstwhile devotion to the king evaporated. Instead, he focused on the status of the church and the maintenance of its laws and privileges, a situation that sparked growing conflicts with the king. Before long, the enmity between the new archbishop and the monarch was so strong that Thomas had to flee to France, where he spent six years. On his return, he offended the king once again by excommunicating several bishops who had condoned the king's policies. In a fit of anger, Henry is said to have uttered the infamous words, Will no one rid me of this turbulent priest? Four knights interpreted this outburst as a call to eliminate the bishop.
AD 1079. Krakow, the 11th of April. There are two different versions of the martyrdom of the Krakow bishop. Here we present two reconstructions of events, according to the journalist Artur Forit. The first unofficial version was set down by a chronicler known as Gallus Anonymous, but it has largely been ignored for 800 years. Taking on board the brief words of the chronicler, the following situation was envisaged by Forit. The drama unfolds in the courtyard of Vavil Castle. Stanislaus stands in the center, his hands bound, his killers around him. King Boleslas has just announced the verdict. The Bishop of Krakow has been sentenced to death by quartering for the charge of treason. The given sign, the executioners set to work. They spread the condemned man on the ground and begin the execution. However, the official version, which is based on the writings of chronicler Vincenti Kadwubek, is somewhat different. This scene takes place at Krakow's so-called Church on the Rock, which lies to the south of the royal castle. Bishop Stanislaus is celebrating Mass. All at once, a group of armed men enters the church. The congregation recognizes King Boleslas and his henchmen. On the king's orders, the knights advance on the bishop, but they're disconcerted by his dignified bearing and retreat in a disorderly manner. Seized by fury, the king draws his sword and strikes the first blow. The bishop falls lifeless to the floor and the king's knights set about dismembering his body. 91 years later, history is set to repeat itself in faraway England. AD 1170, Canterbury, 
the 29th of December. Arthur Forrett, drawing on accounts of royal witnesses John of Salisbury, William of Canterbury and Edward Grimm, reconstructs the scene. As evening descends, four knights draw near the doors of Canterbury Cathedral. They are Reginald Fitzers, Hugh de Morville, William de Tracy and Richard de Bresson. Having entered the building, the knights approach Archbishop Thomas a Becket, who is celebrating Vespers. After a short but violent struggle, they kill Thomas and then degrade his body. Nevertheless, Becket's martyrdom became an immediate Pyrrhic victory. The humiliated king undertook severe acts of penance, and within just three years, Thomas was canonised at the Church of St. Peter in Seigny, entering the pantheon of England's martyrs. This took place in 1173. So The cult of St. Stanislaus began in 1088 with the transference of his relics to Favre Cathedral in Krakow. However, efforts to launch the canonization process only got underway 150 years later, and this occurred under the clear influence of the cult of St. Thomas a Becket in relation to the similarity of their martyrdom. Finally, on the 8th of September 1253, Pope Innocent IV oversaw the final step Stanislas Stepanov's path to sainthood. Meanwhile, the cult of Thomas a Becket spread swiftly, first in England and then across the whole of Western Europe. It also reached Poland at a very early date. The chronicler Vincenti Karubek, Polish promoter of the cult of St. Stanislaus, surely encountered it while studying in Paris. His description of the Passion of St. Stanislaus was inspired by the martyrdom of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Although Kad Wubek does not mention Thomas in the pages of his Polish Chronicle, his description of the martyrdom of Bishop Stanislaus is based on the accounts of the life of the English Archbishop. Thus, the legend of St. Stanislaus in its traditionally accepted form has English roots. Furthermore, this is the earliest recorded contribution of English tradition to Polish culture. The visible traces of the cult of Thomas a Becket in Poland, and particularly in Kraków, 
testify to the great significance of and admiration for his legacy. We do not know, and we will not know. The knowledge we have on the lives of both saints is actually just based on a very small amount of sources. Of these, perhaps just one or two can even be considered as having anything at all in common with the facts. If we approach this knowledge through the framework of philosophy of history, then we do so today with the painful awareness that in today's world, so tormented by media excesses, it's impossible to know the truth. So what can we actually know about these two saints from an entirely bygone era? Perhaps, in fact, there are other ways of cherishing these two bishops of Krakow and Canterbury. Perhaps their lives also have a message. They can point to parallels, talking of the interference in the freedoms and rights of all people 